so you guys can experience all this magic that he has inside of him. If you guys would just please stand to your feet and give us a warm welcome for Gamal Cotton. What's up, Amazon? What you said in the talk really helped me to see like, yes, I can do this. What's up everyone, Gamal Kodner here with another video. This is probably one of my favorite speeches I've ever given. Uh, and it was to Amazon's Black Business Accelerator, their $150 million fund dedicated to supporting founders of color in e-commerce businesses, right? And what's so cool about this is, um, for those of you who don't know me, I started and scaled my family-owned business to seven figures and uh, got acquired in under four years. And this is the same thing I did with that brand, but my six other businesses that I've launched that were six or seven figure cash flow positive businesses. And so it's not a hack or a tip or a trick that will get stale in six months. These are fundamental things that I've used over the past decade and have helped dozens of other people do to create seven figure brands too. So if you are sitting on an idea, just getting started or even seven figures already, and you want to make more money and you want to work less and grow, these are the fundamentals that I highly recommend you implement so that you can make more money. What's up, Amazon? Come on. What's up, Amazon? All right, so this is going to be pretty interactive. What's up, Dom? I see you. Um, pretty interactive, gonna ask you questions. So it's gonna be pretty fun. We got 60 minutes. I won't take all 60 minutes because I wanna open up a lot for questions. I'm gonna go through pretty much the roadmap of the past eight to nine years of entrepreneurship in 60 minutes. So I wanna make sure I give a lot of opportunities for Q&A afterwards, all right? That sound good? All right, so I understand um, a lot of you, pretty much everyone's on Amazon. How many of you have Shopify brands? Okay, how many of those brands are past six figures a year so far? Okay, clap it up, clap it up. All right, so today they asked me to talk about building a six-figure direct-to-consumer community in under 12 months. I'm also gonna talk about building a seven-figure brand because just add another zero, right? It's not that difficult, it's not that difficult. So for those of you who are not at six figures yet, you're in, you know, we got something in store for you. And for those of you who are already at six figures, we're gonna help you take it up a notch, all right? So these are the only things you need to do to build a seven figure brand, not a six, sorry Evelyn, we, we jumped it up a notch, without any investors, without relying on brick and mortar retailers, even if you don't have any money, right? No money, no experience, no marketing degree, or social media followers. When I started this brand, I had 500 followers. I was doing well before, but I didn't have VC money. We didn't have Dom and Act Ventures here cutting checks for us. And so we started from scratch. And we got off to a good start. We went from zero to $60,000 per month in our first 90 days of business. And because of the growth, we got picked up by a lot of cool places. So Founder Magazine got us on their podcast. Shopify had me on the podcast a couple of times and uh, got the pitch for Shark Tank, met Mark Cuban. We did well on the Shopify podcast. We actually got back with them and we did a masterclass. We had over 5,000 people attend our training on advertising, the most attended program that Shopify has ever launched. Uh, that did so well that we did a, a course actually. And so I have one of the most downloaded courses on Shopify right now, all about advertising. Everyone on Shopify is trying to figure out how to get in front of their customers and how to get more customers that's the thing I've been really good at over the past couple of years. Uh, Evelyn said we got up to 100K per month. Uh, we actually started doing a little bit better than that. And uh, before we exited, we were doing pretty well. And so the thing that I want to focus on now, though, is there are two kind of main themes going on in, in uh, uh, e-commerce right now. So there's like the marketplace guys like Amazon, where they're the intermediary between your product and the customers different psychology than going direct to consumer where you own your own brand and you have to manage the relationship with your customers. Both have pros and cons. In an ideal scenario, you'll do both. I'm imagining they're taking care of you on the Amazon side, so I'm gonna not talk about that and spend a lot of time talking about how you can build your own community because there's a lot of pros and cons to that. It's a lot more difficult to get people to know about your product 
but the consumer psychology is a lot different. The main thing I want you to take away from this though, from zero to 60K to two couple million dollars a year or whatever, the main thing we focused on is building community. And we're gonna go over a lot. So I'm gonna go fast on a couple of things. I'm gonna pause right here and give you an opportunity to take a screenshot of this. This isn't church. You can take out your phone, you can take notes, you can take pictures. I encourage it. Tag me at Gamal Codner. Uh, also take a photo of my website. There's gonna be an opportunity for you guys to hang out more, keep in touch after this, and it's gonna be all on the website, all right? Everyone got this? All right, cool. So we started from scratch, scaled up to a few million dollars, and get acqui got acquired in four years. This was by design. Uh, when we started the brand in 2017, I wrote out a one-page business plan that we would get acquired in three to five years. I love working backwards from the goal, right? I call this having a North Star. This is something that um, shapes my direction and how I make decisions and the things I invest my time in. So I was intentionally building my brand to be acquired in three to five years. One of the main things that we did was focus on community. Now, if I, some of the, some of the folks here, anybody, one or two people, what do you guys sell? What, what's your brand about? Anybody? That's what's up. Someone else? Med Century Modern Resort Wear. Over there in the orange jacket. You, you had your hand up. What do you sell? Okay, cool. There you go. So, all right, one more then. Okay. So a good variety of things. One of the interesting thing about us is that when everyone would access what we did, we never talked about our product. From the start, we were focused on building a community for growth-minded African-American men. We just happened to monetize that relationship through grooming products. That's the first shift. For marketplace, people come on Amazon, wherever, going to look and buy something. The brand and the community you build is less important. Going direct to consumer, that is the only way you're gonna differentiate yourself from a well-funded venture capital brand. You gotta start thinking, I don't sell products, I build a community around a certain type of person, all right? So we're gonna jump right into that. And I talk about starting with the end in mind, and here's how I knew it was time to sell my brand. A lot of people, you know, when we sold, they're like, why would you sell, you're making so much money. Well, you guys are everywhere, you're on this, you're on that, why would you sell? And the reality is I spent time in mergers and acquisitions early on, and I was on the side of investing in businesses, cutting checks to founders, and I wanted to be on the other side of it. So that's why I wrote out a one-page business plan on how we're gonna get acquired. And years ago, I studied how the wealthiest people in the world build wealth. On the left side are pretty much, at the time, I mean, they're dropping, they're adding billions like every week. So at the time, they're, uh, they're worth this, but the numbers change. Long story short, the people on the left are the wealthiest people in the world. And they all did the same thing to build wealth. And I started studying the richest African Americans in North America, because you know, you make excuses for yourself, or maybe that's how they do it, that's probably not how I'm gonna do it. Let's study my people. Turns out they did the same thing. Three steps. You own equity in an asset, you build up the value of the asset, and you liquidate the asset, either some or all. It's literally three steps, that's it. This is the common strategy for all major wealth buildings. So real estate, stocks, long-term wise, it's, it's simply broken down into three steps. The thing with entrepreneurs is you're probably sitting on a six, seven, or even an eight-figure asset that you don't know how to liquidate. We spend a lot of time thinking about how to sell our homes, get the equity out of that. Everyone knows how to get their value out of uh, stocks. How do you get the value out of your business though? Most people think, about business is just growing your net income, just growing the revenue. Well, the reality is there's a lot more opportunity for you to get not only uh, financial freedom, but time freedom and option freedom through an exit. So I knew I wanted to plan an exit in the near future. And now I actually spend time helping other founders uh, build their exit strategy too. So the cool thing about this and why I wanted to put the bug in the ear but not spend too much time on it is that because of COVID, during, uh, before COVID, online shopping took up about 16% of all sales worldwide. 
Within the first year of COVID, that jumped up to 30 something percent. So now more than ever, large brands are having to do a lot and invest in direct to consumer. And the cool thing about that for you is big brands suck at being founders. It's actually very difficult, as you know, it's hard, and they just don't have the time for it. So most, most large brands just acquire smaller companies. And one of the main things that they look to inquire or acquire are, is intellectual property, which for today's purposes is gonna be focusing on your actual community and your customer data, right? Think about it, they could drop $10 million on a Super Bowl commercial to try to get black men who are um, high performance black men in corporate America, they may not get 50,000 people, 100,000 people. They could spend some of that money, acquire my business, make money from day one, and fully integrate or cross sell, upsell, downsell all their other suite of products into my customer base. They make money from day one. Make sense? But before I was up here figuring all this stuff out, it wasn't sweet. I didn't even have a beard back in my 20s, right? <laughs> Look at that. Someone said earlier, look at the, some, someone said earlier, I'm lost in my LinkedIn profile picture. That's exactly what that was. And so my, my 20s was interesting. So I'm, I'm Jamaican. I have no accent unless I start drinking Red Stripe. <laughs> my man, okay, a couple of is in here, okay. So later on today at the happy hour, I may sound a little bit more like Bob Marley than I do right now. But um, I had a very humble beginnings. We came over from Jamaica when I was four or five. We stayed in a one bedroom home of, uh, we stayed in a three bedroom home and my family occupied one bedroom. Two other families were in the home with me, right? Jamaicans, for those of you who don't know about Jamaican culture, it's very like safe, be a nurse, be a lawyer, right? Don't do crazy stuff. We just came to work hard and like make some money, right? People laughing, You're, you understand that? Sounds like your family, right? So I, fortunately, I, I, was, I, was, I worked hard and I was making six figures in my 20s. And for a kid from Jamaica, this was like, I struck gold. My parents were so proud of me. I worked for like Wells Fargo, all these like financial services firms, and they couldn't stop showing me off. The truth is though, I actually hated it. I would regret waking up every single day. And I felt bad because I was in this predicament where God obviously blessed me and I was way more fortunate than I could even imagine. I was a VP making, my, making six figures in my 20s, but I felt ungrateful because I, di I didn't enjoy the work. Anybody, anybody here understand what I'm talking about? Right? Right. <laughs> and um, so I started doing all this other stuff, trying to learn entrepreneurship, do all these deals, and I only made $8,000 in two years. How many of you are good at math? How many of you are bad at math, but still know you don't leave a six-figure job to make 4K a year, right? So I was doing a bunch of stuff, everything failed. Everything failed. And so a coach and a mentor changed my life. Have you ever saw that, seen that movie, um, Wolf of Wall Street, where that dude's at the coffee shop and he has a nice car outside, and he's like, what do you do? Show me your paycheck. You ever seen that? Well, I had a childhood friend and I ran into him and he was spending way more money than I thought possible for a legal way to make money. And he was in shorts, he never wore, I was, you saw the LinkedIn photo, I had suit and tie every day. He was in short, he was dressed like this. I was like, what are you doing? How do you do this? And he opened his bank account up and he had uh, seven figures in his bank account. And um, he said, this was like 2012, 2011, and he said, he spent over a million dollars on this thing called Facebook ads. What the hell is a Facebook ad? And I want to learn more. So I took off the next week from work. And I went to his house, right? And I pretty much took out a notepad and paper. I still actually have the same notepad and paper with all the notes that I shared. And I learned everything I could about Facebook ads, about advertising. And in the next 90 days, I made $107,000. That changed my life. That week, of hanging out with that, that friend changed my life. Now, how many of you are good at math and know that you can quit your job if you make $107,000 in 90 days, right? But the reality is I didn't. I didn't believe in myself at this point. Remember that Jamaican thing? Safety, 401k, big, big corporate expense account. So I did this for like six months and um, I prayed about it and I said, God, show me a sign. You know, I finally found something that works and I'm doing this part-time, making more money than my real thing. Just show me a sign, let me know what I should do. That month, I got fired from my job. 
So for those of you who double hand up, you got to be careful what you pray for, right? You might be fired when you go back. You, you got you to gotta lean into it, though. But I did that. And uh, fortunately, now I've managed over $3 million in ads. Um, so I've pretty much the student became the teacher with my mentor. And that's what I'm hoping to do today in 60 Minutes. I'm hoping to share the exact same things I summarized and learned in a week uh, in this presentation today. So one day, you could surpass me in what you spend in ads, and you can have way bigger numbers than what I'm about to share with you today. All right? Sounds good? All right, so everybody likes receipts. So I actually did make 60K in my first 90 days in business. You see that, that hockey stick growth over there. And um, here's how, though. I spent almost $100,000 in my first year in business. When I say this, I get two responses. One is like, yeah, well, you had $100,000 to spend. If I had $100,000 to spend, I will be doing good, too. How many of you thought that? Be real. Be real. All right. So here, here's what happened, though. Here's why I spent $100,000. Column left is $3,600. bucks. 35 dollars is $35,000. How many of almost a 10x return. How many of you would spend $3,600 to make $35,000? So I was literally trying to figure out the fastest way I could spend $3,600 every single time because I knew I would 10x my investment. That's how we got to 100 grand. The second thing people hear when they say that is, but I don't have that money. Where do you get $100,000 from? Well, you don't spend $100,000 just like that. My daily budgets are 10 to $14. How many of you have $10 to spend to try to 10x your return on investment, right? Right, so you spend $10 and eventually you figure out what works and you try to put as many $10 in that machine as possible to spit out a 10x return. And the cool thing about this is there's kind of two ways of thinking. A lot of people are like, yeah, but you spent all that money. I hear people saying, oh, I, I built my business. I built a seven-figure business or a six-figure business, and I didn't spend any money on marketing as like some form of endearment. In my mind, I'm like, yeah, well, think about how much money you left on the table or how, how much you could have grown faster or sooner. And so I think when people do that, it's like a defense mechanism because they don't understand advertising, so they, they say that. But the reality is if you know how to do it well, we can acquire 1,000 customers in a month. And if you build community and brand like we're going to talk about, 44% of them come back to shop with you next month for free. So next month, 444 people are going to come back and shop. And then the number just compounds. Make sense? All right. So the only difference between all this stuff that I'm talking about here and where I started back in 2013, and I'm assuming you guys are somewhere between where I started and somewhere here, is I did three things. And this is the three, these are the three things that we're going to cover today. So one is I learned the difference between brand building, advertising, and marketing. Very subtle differences, but very important. I see a lot of founders confusing that. And clarity on that is going to help you move forward faster. Number two is in order to build a $2 million brand or a million dollar brand online, you should not try to be better than your competition. It's counterintuitive, but you should not try to be better. It's a waste of time. You should also not focus on selling a million dollars worth of products. I alluded to that early on when I said I didn't describe internally. We never described as what we did as sold products. We focus on building community. Number three is the most predictable way to find those strangers once you have that dialed in, so they're ready to buy and give you their money, all right? So the first one is I learned the difference between brand building, advertising, and marketing. How many of you know, how many of you think you know the difference between either three? Can anyone explain any definition of either three of these? Very good, that's correct. Anybody else? Come on, somebody knows advertising and marketing. We went to business school. For sure, that's correct. Correct. Here's how I like to explain it. So marketing is creating awareness and communicating value. This is you telling someone, I have great products. Advertising is putting marketing on steroids. This is paid marketing 
So instead of telling one person that in an interaction, you can tell 10,000 people that per day. And branding is what Derek said. This is other people now understanding that you have a great product. And this is done through your actions that create emotions, perception, and feeling, right? Very important, emotions, perception, and feeling. A brand is not a logo, it's an experience. There's some things about branding that you can't explain. There's a reason why I have Apple Watch, Apple Phone, iPad, Apple this, Apple that. I can't explain why they're better, but I just don't mess with anything else, right? <laughs> Anybody else like that? And a brand is not simply a product. It's a culture. It's how people feel, right? And so a brand is built one interaction at a time. But I want to do something a little bit different and switch it up. Instead of brand, I want you to hear community. Because oftentimes, I work with founders in two capacities. I have a coaching program. The first are like founders who want to build a 10K per month uh, direct to consumer community. We cover marketing, all this kind of stuff that we're going over. And then the second group are people who are six and seven figures, and now they're thinking about an exit strategy. So we help them run their business better and just enjoy being a founder a little bit more. And oftentimes I talk to them and there are people who spend $30,000 on a website because that's brand. And this is something I hone to them. I really don't think that kind of detail should be focused on unless you're like an eight-figure business. Brand at this stage is more than just your product, logo, website. That's just the tip of the iceberg. What's below is what's most important in this phase. And so cross out brand, replace it with community a community-centered brand, right? And so that's everything that happens pre-purchase, right? This is, this is how they see your um, Instagram. This is the message you're communicating. These are the types of other influencers or people or partners that you associate with, right? If you have these values, but your partners have different values, people are gonna notice that. It's not gonna be in cohesion. And so these are what happens on your website. This is what happens post-purchase. This is as simple as customer service, right? If you're a premium product, you need to have Chick-fil-A customer service. Yeah. Not the Popeye's chicken and biscuit. You can't be charging folks Chick-fil-A money, and then when they call in for, uh, to, to talk about something, you're treating them like a Popeye's customer service person, right? Make sense? It's the whole thing. It's not just logo with Popeye's customer service. It's not just brand website. It's the whole thing. And so, now that you kind of get the idea of the difference between brand and marketing and advertising, today's presentation is going to be spent mostly on uh, the first part is building a, um, a brand, a community-centered brand, and how that's done. And then we're going to focus on advertising to multiply that message to that audience, right? I typically focus on those two out of the three. Marketing is more like word of mouth and it's kind of slower. I focus on just once you figure out what's working, get it to as many people as possible. And so now we're gonna jump into how to build a community center brand. And like I mentioned earlier, you should not focus on trying to be better or even selling products. You should focus on being different. And so good, better, different. A big thing that gets in the way of the founders that I work with is everyone, they don't realize that everyone is saying they have good products. I've never went to a website and they're like, you know what, we have the second best ingredients. Our clothes aren't really that well. They fade as soon as you wash them, right? Our beard care products really dry out your beard. No one says that. Everyone is saying the best. Everyone's saying this. Everyone's saying that. So you really end up sounding the same. And the thing is, everyone's trying to go after everybody, and they're all saying the same thing. But the best community-based brands are rooted in empathy. They don't just sell products. They speak to a specific person. They solve problems for those people. They inspire those people. And they tell stories, stories that other people can relate to. And if you want to figure that out, the most important thing that we're going to talk about today is this. This is a thing that you take a picture of, too, by the way. I'm going to take a picture of this. This? You got to keep your phone out, girl. You got to get ready. That must be an Android. What's that? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. 
Um, so three Ps, person, pain, promise, right? This is what specific person do you want to be meaningful to? What pain point in their lives do you want to focus on? And what promise can you make them about that pain in their lives? So I'll give you a very specific example, and I'll repeat it. What person are you helping? What pain do they have? What promise can you make them? So for our brand, we focus on African-American men with beards. So the pain that we focus on, there's a bunch of people who are selling the same product. Shea Moisture, like big brands, Bevel, they raised $40 million, a little less with my credit card, right? How can I compete? So there's a wide spectrum of people. Normally when I ask people who, they, who their, uh, their customer are, they say, oh, we sell to people, we sell to women 25 to 40. That's not, that's not a customer, right? That's not deep enough. The riches are in the niches, right? And so for example, we sold beard care products to black men. On one end, they're like the super vegan people, right? They're waking up, they're doing hot yoga, they're blending their own juice at the house, they're doing all this stuff, right? They care all about their ingredients. On the other spectrum, there's like these rappers and entertainers and athletes, and they're a different customer profile, right? Like Rick Ross and his beard care product went after them. And then in the middle, there were people who were like me on my LinkedIn profile who couldn't grow a beard at corporate America because I had to present myself well, but I had tailored suits, nice, nice cars, nice shoes, and my beard looked like crap. My beard was patchy, it was dry, I just didn't understand it. We decided to focus on these people, people who are entrepreneurs, people who were high performance men at corporate America, who cared about how they looked, who had a lot of self-confidence, but just couldn't figure this piece out. For a variety of reasons we picked that one, it was like the profile I most identified with, and we're gonna get into how personal story and personal brand helps you build this more authentically. But that was the market that we saw that was most underserved. And the problem with that though, is once you figure out who your person is, you don't really have an opportunity to make an impact on them because uh, there's a famous study with Stan between Stanford and Columbia, they collaborated on this and they realized we are now in an attention economy. It used to be like time is money, now attention is, uh, is money. The average consumer who has a social media profile is only giving you about 10 seconds of their time before they make a decision and then move on. How the hell are you gonna talk to your customers in 10 seconds, right? That makes it increasingly difficult. That's why places like Amazon Marketplace and retail and Walmart, that does well because you don't have to worry about getting attention. You could just send your product there. But the bad thing with that is you don't have a relationship with your customers, right? That 44% return rate, you don't have that when they're just, when they're buying products, not based on your brand, they're just buying products based on their need, right? And so the opportunity is that there's over 2 billion people who shop online and it's grown like crazy. The visual representation of two billion people would be this crowded train station, right? So let's say that guy right there on the top with the orange shirt who's risking his life for some weird reason to get to work or wherever he's going. Let's say he was my ideal customer. How would you get that person's attention online? What are some ways you could get that person's attention? How are you currently trying to get the attention of your customer right now? Anybody? Stand out there with the sign. Figure out where he's going. Anybody else? <laughs> Figure out their needs. Good responses. One more. Really good answers. So <clears throat> what I see happening is people go online and they're like, my consumer is a man who's 20 to 50, right? And they're trying to get everyone's attention. Hey. Hey, want beard oil? And no one's paying them attention. A better way to do this would be to say, hey, Evelyn from BBA. Maybe if you, yell, if you yell loud enough or you have a sign, you see this happen at the airport, right? And you come off the airport, you see someone with your sign that catches your attention. You, maybe you can get Evelyn's attention if she's in this crowded room, right? Another way to do this is to build a community with shared values, shared beliefs that attract these people into your community, right? You hear some of these noises, right? That means something. <laughs> Remember I said I'm from Jamaica, right? So I went to college and I came on campus. I knew nobody. I thought I was like a bad man, but when I really got to college, I'm like, yo, I miss my parents, yo. This is sad. <laughs> and I went to this thing called the Union. It, every school, it's like a different name. Fam, you have the set. And 
I started noticing all these people with like red shirts and then black shirts and all these other color shirts and they're like gathering together. I'm like, what is this? And other people in my freshman class who felt like lost and confused later on in the year, I noticed them with these color shirts on, right? I'm like, okay, they found a family. What's going on here? When my Jamaican family came to visit from the outside looking in, they're like, oh, why are these people have these shirts on? From the outside looking in, they look pretty similar, right? My mom kept confusing this one with that one, and I was like, mom, that's not that, it's this. To her, it didn't make sense, but for the people in those communities, there was a very clear difference between their organization and the other organizations, right? And they connected for a variety of reasons, because on the outside looking in, there is a lot of similarities, but on the inside looking out, there's very big differences. And that's the type of thing you need to think through as you're building your own brand to be competing with similar industry, sorry, similar companies in your industry. Does that make sense? The best way to find people in that crowded train station is to connect on shared values, shared beliefs, and tell your story of how you got here as a founder to attract those people into your community. Now, if you're thinking about that and you're thinking, man, how do I do this for my brand? and you don't have it figured out yet, this is usually due to something I like to call the ugly baby syndrome. How many of you have ever heard of this? That's right, because I made it up. <laughs> I wanted to see who was a liar in here. Good thing all you guys are ethical, honest people. Good job, good job. We're gonna do good together, I like honest people. So. I recently had a baby, Nori, she's one, she's beautiful. But let's just put on our imagination hat and pretend she wasn't beautiful, right? How would I know, though? No one in their right mind would tell me that my daughter was ugly. They would say things like, she's precious. <laughs> oh, she looks just like you, right? What does that mean? <laughs> and in this analogy, as you can guess, that ugly baby may be your business. Right? No, listen, because your friends, your family members, they see you traveling to Seattle. You're not getting the type of traction you want. You're not getting the type of traction you deserve. You see other people with similar products, they're not as good as yours, and you can't figure out why people aren't shopping with you and buying your products. And your friends, family members, significant others, they're close to you, they see how much time you're putting in this, you're maxing out credit cards, you're spending every waking hour after work working on this thing. This thing is your baby, right? So a lot of founders think they have this type of baby, <laughs> when in the reality, their baby may be closer to this. The good thing about this is, though, in the tech world, we call this a pivot. The reality is, every startup that launches, they don't get it right out the door. So maybe you have a great product, but you're selling it to the wrong group. Maybe you have a great product, but your price is too cheap. There's small things you could do to tweak this baby and turn it back into this baby. So the opportunity though for us that a lot of people don't have the opportunity for is you never get to face the reality. People never really objectively get to tell you, hey, you know what, 90% of your business is great, but I love you and I never really had the courage to tell you about this part. But if you figure this little small part, part out, you can take off and hit the races. So it's important to know that um, you don't know your answers to what your customers want, only your customers do. Your friends and family members and loved ones, they don't know the answers to it. So it's important to, as you're build community, as you're building community, to go out and actually speak to your customers. Ask them what they're looking for. If you don't want to speak to them, go look on Amazon reviews. There's a really helpful section that says, under all the reviews, this review was helpful. Sort competitor products and sort by the products who have the most highly rated reviews and just see, see the good things that they say about this product, say the bad things that they say about this product, read your own reviews. That's a great opportunity for you to figure out what areas of your business needs improvement and to be able to fix those things so you can hit the ground running. Make sense? Here's that more in practice because this is the biggest um, speed bump that we get. Pretty much every founder who has not got to 100K fast per year, they're stuck figuring this out. They're, they're in this phase trying to figure out who they're gonna be meaningful to, how their product could stand out and be different. And so a lot of the work we do is like here, so I'm gonna spend a couple of slides talking about this, giving you real life examples so you can figure it out for yourselves. So Glory is a fitness influencer that launched a product. Uh, she launched these workout bands for women. And she was doing 
a lot of work and making no sales. And so she worked with me, and um, I was like, Lori, who's your product for? She said, she said work, uh, stay at home moms so they can get a better workout at home. I said, Glory, are you a mom? No. All right, well, how many moms did you speak to before launching this? None. How many of your customers have you talked to about this? Zero. So what we figured out in research is that stay-at-home moms actually hate this idea. They look forward to going to the gym and leaving the rugrats at home. So someone showing up and taking away their little escape every day was a horrible idea. Glory figured that out pivoted, made her bands for folks who actually went to the gym and improved the workouts that way, took off. Hit 10K months in like the next six day, 60 days. Right, ugly baby, but a fixable ugly baby. Make sense? Here's another thing. Uh, these two brands, they sold uh, hair extensions. You can't see, but literally they're saying the same thing. This is the most sought after hair ever. This will blah, 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 blah. They're all saying the, literally the same thing. Similar price points. They're all saying the same thing. This one's 99, this one's 97. They're all saying the exact same thing. They don't think they're saying the exact same thing. They don't understand why people aren't un believing them when they say this is the most beautiful hair ever, the most highly sought after hair ever. So we dug deeper into this. I'm like, all right, who's your community? No one had an answer to that. So founder one, uh, she, she grew up, uh, she was the dark-skinned sister out of the light-skinned sister. And people grew up in her family um, calling her sister pretty, right? She never heard that. And so she grew up being impacted by this colorism thing. And so her relationship with hair extensions meant something different to her. Founder number two, she was an essential worker. She, her relationship with extensions allowed her to, um, with her confidence. So she was able to style herself while she worked and still maintain her, her hairstyle. And so her relationship and her reason for wanting to launch this brand was completely different. No one was telling the story. Everyone was trying to sell and this is the most beautiful pattern ever. So we leaned into that. Founder number one shared that community and opened that up to other women who experienced that growing up, right? Who grew up thinking that they weren't as pretty because their hair was kinkier or this or that or that. She built an amazing community. Founder number two went full into essential workers, people who have to still feel pretty and look good, but have to go work in the elements every day, right? She built a whole other community that way. Some of the content they started creating had nothing to do with hair. Some of the content they had to do, founder number one, maybe included having a therapist on to talk just about uh, what it looks like to be beautiful, right? How it looks like to be beautiful in your own skin. Other things to build community. So, if founder number three came on and had the same website and now offered this thing for $80, do you think founder number one's customers are going to jump ship for an $80 product? No. Right? Now, if you hone in that deep in the, the community you're building, how easy do you think it would be to find people and build community? Pretty easy, right? That's the level of detail that you need to get in building community so that your those community members find you, right? You, you saw the Greek the Greek thing, the Greek uh, image I had on campus. That's the type of organic thing that you need to have to push. And by the way, you think about uh, building a community. And some people, when you get to this phase, they're like, "Well, I don't know if that many people exist for my specific niche, right?" And so the road to one million dollars is very simple. This is another thing you're going to take a picture on, like two slides, right? I'll get there and let you take out, take out your phone and take a picture. Android lady, you might want to get your phone out early. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so you need one product that you sell for $30 and you sell 30 of them per day. And then you find two more products that you can sell 30 of them per day. By the way, I just told you there are 2 billion people online shopping every single year. You just need 30 of them. That simple math, Q phone pictures, that simple math is a million dollars. Three $30 products selling 30 of each unit per day is a million dollars. The road to a million dollars is simple. The road to $100,000 is simple and easy. You only need to sell 10 of those products per day, 10 $30 products per day, just one of them, 
to get to 100,000. It's actually like $109,000 or something like that. How many of you think you could dig deep into your story and find 10 people out of 2 billion to rock with your community, right? Show of hands. All right, who thinks that you cannot find 10 people per day? Show of hands. Right, super easy. Now, here are some ways that you can build community once you get that locked in. Now, advertising changes over time. In general, I like to focus on places where people consume long form content. Attention spans are low, as we mentioned slides, a couple slides earlier. And even though that's great for reach and views, the studies show that that doesn't really impact conversions as much as long form content. The relationship someone has watching a 10 second reel or a 10 second TikTok is very different from the relationship someone has watching a 30 minute YouTube video on how it was growing up dark skin in a family where no one told her that they loved her, right? Or that she was pretty. A deeper customer relationship. So YouTube, social pages, podcasts are a great place to build community and partner with people. By the way, when I say this, I mean partner with other people who already have these communities and share your story on their platform. Make sense? Right? Because we didn't have a platform early on, so we borrowed other people's spaces. And other organizations, a lot of the times, people think only online. But the reality is there's real life things happening in real life. And a lot of the organizations I partnered with early on to grow our brand, they didn't have big followers online. So here's a real life example. We recognize that growth-minded men also happen to be in fraternities. And so we had a campaign where we uh, were based in Atlanta. We had a campaign where we brought all the fraternities in, sat them down, and got an opportunity for them to share what their heritage meant to them, because our brand's Fresh Heritage. What their heritage meant to them. How is it like being a founder? How is it like being a, a, a dad? How is it like being the head of household? How is it like moving up the corporate ladder as a black man? We built out all this great content, ran them on YouTube, ran ads. We had specific alphas talking about what our brand meant to them, showing only to alphas. We had the same with all the different organizations. How easy do you think it was for us to find 10 people every day that resonated with that campaign, right? And so the other thing that I want to talk about is focus on pillar content. You get really, really distracted by trying to jump up and down in TikToks that you lose the, uh, you lose the idea that we're going deep here and you should really try to focus on content that is emotionally or painful to your niche. It hurts, but that's how you're really going to build community with them. Remember earlier those two founders, Essential Worker and um, the other girl? They made content. I made content. So our content, the, for our content, the folks who were in corporate America, who were dressed to the T but had a patchy beard, what we recognize is that they, had, um, they lost confidence in their ability with their beard. They felt confident in all other areas. They were the man in the boardroom. They could close sales deals. They could close all sorts of stuff, but they didn't have the confidence with their patchy beard. So we made a blog video, what black men with patchy beards can do in the next 60 days, right? It's not, it's not rocket science. That thing ran for three years. We got 10 to 15,000 organic search views every single month for like two to three years on that topic. I'm proud to say I never danced on any TikTok. I never danced on any reel. And our business still did well, right? You don't have to resort to trendy things to build a long lasting business. And the third and final phase of this presentation is we've covered the difference between brand in, advertising, and marketing. Brand in is, in my term, building community. And we went deep into figuring out how you can share your story and find your niche and community. And in Q&A, we'll, we'll talk more if you have some examples, right? And then once you do that, the importance of building community versus trying to sell product and how the mindset shift allows you to build an easier um, um, sales funnel with your customers, right? And now we're going to go in, once you have that stuff down packed, how can you actually use advertising to find them? What is the most predictable way to find strangers who are actually ready to buy and give you their money? So I mentioned we have a course where we teach advertising. And a lot of the hiccups that um, we get from founders are like, well, I heard advertising changed. The new iOS 14 update. How many people think that you know, Facebook ads are dead, Instagram ads are dead? 
it sucks. I'll, I, 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 won't, I won't lie. It sucks more than it did two years ago. But literally, the same things I'm doing today is what I learned in 2013. It's changed so much there. The main thing is focusing on fundamentals. Matter of fact, in 2013, the book I learned on how to use for advertising was a book made in 1950s, 1953, Scientific Advertising. Not much has changed since then. The fundamentals are the same. So the basic fundamentals I want to take away with are, by the way, how many people run ads today? OK, good. How many people do not run ads? OK, good. So this is a really good thing to think of when thinking about ads. Essentially, this is the upside framework. On the far left is you. These are people who are unaware of anything except their own identity. So in my brand's example, no, let's use, let's use another example. Let's use a dentist. So let's just pretend someone living in the middle of nowhere, this, their teeth hurt, and they have no clue they have something called a cavity. In P, they become aware that um, they identify what their problem is, right? And so they're like, OK, my mouth hurts because I have this thing called a cavity. And then they evolve into realizing that there's a person out there called a dentist who could remove that cavity that would solve their problem of their mouth hurting. But then they become aware of Gamal's dental practice, right? Now they're in the wise phase. Now they're realizing that, huh, Gamal is a solution provider to the thing that I'm trying to solve. And then they get to the deal phase. This is, does Gamal take my insurance? Where is he located? Is his staff clean? How much does it cost? What are the reviews like? All that kind of stuff. The problem I see with most people running ads is they're not communicating with people the correct way based on where they're at in the journey. What that means is, they're trying to give a 20% discount to someone that's in problem phase. They don't even know who you are. They don't even know what you stand for. They don't even know that you provide a solution to them, right? And so with our product, it was we had to go through the whole life cycle of the upside framework because a lot of what we realized and why we picked this niche was that it was just a, an awareness and an um, education thing. Black men just weren't used to using these products to groom themselves. A lot of them are just using soap and water to do their beards every day. And so we had to talk to people at different phases along the journey to eventually make them become a customer. So if you have a very limited budget, I would do all the other things I talked about before to build up awareness to your problems organically without any paid ads. I would only use paid ads in advertising when people are in the Y and D phase. This is because they're the you know, bottom of funnel, warm audience, all these other slam, all these other terms. Essentially, it means they're more ready to buy. They're closer to taking out their uh, credit cards and giving it to you. And so when you focus on just those people, you get an even bigger return on investment. So before I showed you like a 10 to 1 return, I'm not great at this math, but I spent $4,800, made $85,000. That seemed a lot better than a 10 to 1 return on investment, right? And these are the ads that we only spent to people who are in the Y and the D phase. Here are some real life practical examples of those ads that you could go home and run today for people who are in the Y and D phase. So how many of you post on Instagram and less than 20% of your audience sees your content? Everyone else, what are you guys getting? You guys are getting what, 50%, 60%? I suck, I'm getting like 5%. Right? And so the good thing about ads is you can run ads to everyone who's, who's a follower of yours. Right, So you put out a promo, you drop a new bag, you drop a new whatever, you drop it to crickets. Well, you can run ads to people who have already opted in to follow you. They know you. They're just not seeing your content. Right, They know about your solution. They're just waiting for the deal. Uh, we talked about long form content. So if you drop one, a one minute reel and someone watches five, second of that, five seconds of that, it's very different from someone who watches 50 seconds of that, right? So you can self-select and say, all right, I want to show this content or this promo or this whatever you made to people who are more engaged with my content. Only show this to people who've watched 75% or more of my content. Or people who've ever messaged me, right? Over the course of the year, you got Black Friday coming up. There are people who message your brand and the one to learn more. You don't know if they convert or not. You can run a special campaign for everyone who's ever messaged you over the past year. High intent people. The other thing you can do that happens a lot now, where you, you post and no one's commenting on your stuff, but you see that they're sending it out in groups, right? You ever notice that? 
They're like, yo, no one's liking or saying anything, but I see like 20 people setting my stuff into a group, right? What's going on? Well, you can run ads to people who have self-selected and shared that information with their friends. Very, very powerful ways to use ads to get in front of people who are in a way saying, I like your stuff, but social organically is just not allowing your content to get in front of them. The other thing you can do, which is more obvious, but I just wanted to share it with people who are at early stages of running ads is obviously anyone who added a product to your cart and don't check out. So only about two to 3% of consumers will buy on the first time. The data shows that most people need seven encounters before they make a purchase decision. So it's our job to kind of stay in front of them. And so you can run ads, they're called retargeting ads, to just get back in front of people to say, hey, I saw you started looking at some products. I wanted to incentivize you to finish checking out today or we're running low on stock. Or people who started checkout in stock. Or people who bought one product but didn't buy product two, right? Um, or people who, in my case, are bared products finished every 30 to 45 days, they would buy one product and not buy others. Or they would buy one product or two products and just we wouldn't hear from them again. We would run ads to get back in front of them and say, hey, I think your stuff is coming down. Don't, don't run out in, in time for date night. Or make sure you show up for work on uh, looking fresh, right? And so we'd run these ads to just get back in front of people. And when you do all these things right, the reason we're able to grow so fast is because, can't really see it, but we pulled a report of up to 1,000 people. We had over 33,000 people come back and buy our products more than once, largely because of ads. This generated, um, what's it, about $1.4 million, and this report stops at 1,000 people. So the other thing I wanted to show is that we had some people buy our stuff 46 times over the course of two years. 46 times a $25 beard oil. That guy dropped $1,500 on beard oil. That's crazy. The other thing we did is we had a membership program. And we had over 3,000 people join our membership program. And I could talk to you about this, because this is an important part in building community. Subscription revenue, membership revenue is really important. And the thing that most people get wrong about this is they think just offering a $10 referral is going to get someone to sign up. Or they think just giving someone whatever stupid discount is going to get someone to sign up. The reality is, is that's not true. Remember back when I was talking about digging deeper and having shared values? What we, we realized for our person is they like to be the person who was known to give the good gift. They wanted to have stuff that no one knew about yet. So we didn't really even talk about discounts. What we talked about was giving them opportunities to put other people on or be the type of guy, the alpha male, right, that everyone is looking up to and asking them, yo, how'd you fill those patches in your beard? Or what'd you do for that? So we really leaned into that when we were uh, conveying our message and telling the stories about why people should join and buy more and more and more. So think deeper, right? Think less about money or discount and deeper into how can you make your customers more of who they are? How can you help them show up in their lives more how they would like to show up in their lives, right? And always make sure that your customer is the hero in the story. Your products are not the hero in the story. Every great movie, every great Hollywood movie has a hero that goes on this journey that overcomes um, obstacles to come out on, on top. A big mistake brands make is they feel like their product is the center of the show and the star of the show. That is incorrect. Your customer is. Your brand is not the Karate Kid. Your brand is Mr. Miyagi. Your customer is the Karate Kid, right? Luke Skywalker, that's not you. That's the customer. All the main people in these movies are not you. They're your customers. Your brand is in support of them. So we figured out a way to help our customers show up better in their lives to be the persons they always wanted to be using our products as a mechanism to get there. Make sense? And lastly, we, we did a lot. I think we're down to like, we're probably 50 minutes in this presentation. I just want to remind you that you do not need to be a marketing expert to execute on all of this. You really just need a reliable process and a system for getting 10 people a day. If you're already at six figures, 30 people a day. And you start. A big mistake I see founders make is when we are on these weekly calls, they're telling me about brands who've been in existence for five years, 
brands who are doing five, $10 million in sales. You can't compare your day one or your year one or year two to someone who is your eight, nine, 10 in business. The things they're doing now is not what they did starting off. One of my favorite movies is this movie called Catch Me If You Can. Have you ever seen it? It's an amazing movie about a con artist, which is weird because I said I like honest people. But this con artist was pretty cool. He pretended to be a pilot, a lawyer, all sorts of stuff. And one of the favorite takeaways from this is he pretended to be a professor, forgot what topic he taught, he taught but uh, he finally got caught and the FBI was like, dude, how on earth did you teach a class and you're not a professor? And he was like, well, the trick is I only had to be one chapter ahead of the students. You don't need to be a subject matter expert. You don't need to compete with people who, like me, who spent $3 million on ads. You just need to be one step ahead of your competitors, right? That's what I want you to focus on. One competitor at a time, and before you know it, you'll be spending a million, two, three, whatever in advertising. You'll have the brand that you want, the six and seven figure brand. But that's the takeaway I wanted to leave you with. Only focus on being one step ahead of your competitors. That's your only focus. If you do that, and you do that enough, you would look up and you'll be ahead.